Um, Thomas Carlyle, no great man lives in vain. The history of the world is but the biography of great men. Wrong. The history of the world is about that 117 billion people that Ferky just mentioned a moment ago. Those are the people I'm interested in. Notice that this gentleman says, no great man lives in vain. He lived 50 years before the vote was accorded to women in England, Scotland, and Wales, 58 years before the 19th Amendment gave the vote to women in this country. So he might have thought differently had he lived on a little longer. But the point is, that is not the kind of history that I'm interested in. Classically, historians have been interested in the big names, in the military events, in the political escapades, and so forth. But my interest has always been primarily in the lives of ordinary people, the people whom I say are living on the other side of history. And besides, it's not the case that ordinary people have not affected the course of history. Take the example here of Herostratus, a complete non-entity, who happened to burn down one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the great temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Why did he do that? In the cause of celebrity. After the destruction of the temple, the Ephesians said, Nobody must ever mention the name of Herostratus ever again. Well, I just mentioned it, so it didn't actually work. But there's an example of somebody of no consequence whatsoever affecting history. More significantly, Gavrilo Princip assassinated the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, on June the 28th, 1914, thereby igniting World War I, a complete non-entity who nonetheless changed the course of history forever. I'm not going to be talking, however, about major events at all. I'm much more interested, as I said, in ordinary life, and in particular on those who live on the other side of history. It's a very large group. It is the majority of that 117 billion that we were talking about. So, the enslaved. The slave population in the ancient world, in any ancient society that we can track, was enormous. I wouldn't want to put a figure on it, but I think it's entirely likely that it was, in some societies at least, including Rome, and I would think as well Greece, half the population was enslaved. The infirm. Sickness in the ancient world had most people, sooner or later, chronically ill. And there was very little that could be done to assist them. So lots of people would have been dealing with chronic illness for years and years until it finally took them off the disabled, a particular group that I'm interested in, who again would have been the majority of people over the age of 20 or 25, let's say. Anybody who suffered an injury was unlikely to recover fully because medicine was still very much in its infancy and also not very available because it was costly. Impoverishment as well. We see the world of the ancients through the eyes of the elite, the privileged, the wealthy. But there was a huge group of people who were living on the edge constantly throughout their lives, who had no sense of security and very little in the case of any kind of tragedy, such as famine, that might come their way. The elderly. There was virtually no recourse for people in the ancient world who were elderly other than to rely upon their families. 
There was no such thing, of course, as an old people's home, and most people would be completely dependent on their nearest and dearest. And this was particularly troublesome in cases where there were limited resources, because you have an elderly relative, you don't have enough to feed that relative, and the likelihood is that relative will go by the wayside. Beggars. We meet beggars already in the Odyssey. A beggar who is begging at the house of Odysseus, and Odysseus competes for the right to beg in his own house. Refugees. The ancient world was extremely mobile. There was no guarantee that you would be living in the same house the next year. Due to warfare, due to environmental challenges and so forth, the ancient world was a world on the move. Prisoners of war. Warfare, of course, was constant. In the Greek world, as soon as it was spring, people woke up in the morning and said, who should we fight today? And off they would go, and they would fight through the summer months until the winter came, and they decided to go back home, except in the case of the Peloponnesian War, which was the first total war when warfare continued throughout the winter months. The Romans went to war at the beginning of the year as well, in the month of March. Mars, the god of war, so named because that was the month in which Mars was celebrated and the Romans departed. Warfare was the normal condition. Peace was abnormal. Only twice were the doors of the Temple of Janus closed, indicating that the Roman Empire was at peace in the time of the Emperor Augustus. Women were on the other side of history as well. I put down there especially widows. Women who were vulnerable, and no one was more vulnerable in the ancient world than widows who had no supporter and perhaps very little resource as well. Children, especially orphans, for obvious reasons. Orphans were despised. Orphans weren't wanted. They were frequently left to simply beg. And finally, social rejects, a huge class as well. I put down there murderers, for instance, but criminals of all kinds and prostitutes. So those are the people who belonged on the other side of history. And I say, out of my head, so to speak, my wild guess, 99.9% .9 of any ancient population. There's another way in which we can talk about the other side of history. And that is when we look at our roots going back hundreds of thousands of years. If we go back 300,000 years, there were nine other hominins, that is to say, human species like ourselves who were wandering on the face of the earth, in addition to our own species, Homo sapiens. By the year 10,000, they were all gone. Why were they gone? Possibly because of genocide, possibly because of environmental disasters, and possibly because of a combination of both. What can we say about the time before the other side of history emerged, when there were people who were, in a stratified sense, rejects in the general way in which I'm talking about them? One of the earliest pieces of evidence for the ancient world came to light a few years ago in mainland Greece, near a place called Megalopolis, where a site of elephant butchery was discovered. We might not think of elephants as particularly plentiful in mainland Greece, but 50,000 years ago, you would not have been surprised to encounter an elephant or a rhinoceros or indeed a lion. But the point here is that 50,000 years ago, humans were cooperating. You can't kill an elephant unless a large group of people come together, communicate, and work cooperatively. So, 
When I talk about the ancient world and I think about the other side of history, what actually produced a society in which there were people who were on that other side? And here is what I speculate. We're talking about prehistory, before there were any written records, so we can't possibly know for certain. We can only judge as best we can on the evidence of archaeology and intelligent guesswork. Firstly, around 10,000 BCE, sedentism becomes a feature of certain societies. Sedentism means living in a settled community. And where would you do this? Primarily by the banks of a river. What would be your activities? Arable farming, animal husbandry, and fishing. And in those conditions, population increases because life is just that little bit more secure than it was when you were a hunter-gatherer. And as a result of the population increase, there is competition for limited resources. There are always limited resources in the world. There are limited resources in the world today. There is desire to increase land. There is a desire to gain mineral wealth. And the same was true to a greater degree in the ancient world. And this, in turn, led to the subjugation of fellow members within the community, including at one end, the invention of slavery. This in turn produces the uneven distribution of resources within the community, and that leads to social stratification. At the top end, you have the aristocrats, and perhaps the king, at the bottom end, you have all those who are dispossessed and who are working for other people. In addition to which, a whole other element enters into the picture, and that is enmity towards outsiders on grounds of difference, and that too leads to conflict. So, all this is before we have any written records. Our earliest written records, or at least, I should say, our earliest writing dates from about 3,400 BCE, probably in Mesopotamia, though there are other contenders for first past the post. But what we have at that point is nothing that will help us to really understand how people lived, other than that we know that they were engaged in trade, we know that they worshipped gods, we know that they had some kind of social hierarchy. A particular feature is the cylinder seal, which was used when somebody passed a message from one person to another. So, irrespective of the fact that I am primarily interested in the people who were disadvantaged, not the elite, there were certain conditions that prevailed in every ancient society in the ancient world. One third of any ancient population was under the age of 15, compared with 19% today. Only about 7% of any ancient population was over the age of 60. That compares with about 20% in the US today and 30% in Japan, the country where the population is aging in an accelerated way. Third, everything that the Greeks or the Romans or the Egyptians or the Mesopotamians or whoever you like to look at did, how they lived, was against a background of infinite precariousness, the like of which we can hardly fathom today. Death was all around you, stalking you 24-7, not just through illness, but all other kinds of accidents, which I'll be talking about in a moment. It was an extremely dangerous, precarious world. Everyone accepted that slavery was a fact of life. Not even in the Gospels 
do we find a single word raised against slavery. And of course, to add to this, there were no painkillers. So whatever aches and pains you had, you better well put up with them because they're never going to go away and they're only going to get worse, especially if you have toothache, not a pretty thought. To give some idea of the scale of slavery in the ancient world, we might turn to the island of Delos, which is in the um, Cyclades, a tiny little island, important because of its very insignificance geographically, which became a commercial hub in the Roman world. And the geographer Strabo, who was writing in the period of Augustus, tells us that a thousand slaves were auctioned on the island every day. 365,000 slaves a year, in other words. Now, Delos wasn't the only center of slave trade, but many other parts of the Roman world where you could buy and sell slaves. So that just gives some indication of the massiveness of this enterprise. And it's not, of course, just the Romans or the Greeks who enslaved. When we read the Covenant Code in the book of Exodus, which follows immediately after the Ten Commandments, we read, when a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people. What this law is establishing is actually certain rights for female slaves, specifically a daughter whom the father chooses to sell into slavery. It's extraordinary from a modern perspective that such a thing should be not only allowed but almost enshrined in a law code. The daughter is given certain protections, as I said. What it means here is that she shall not go out as the male slaves do. She shall have certain privileges. Obviously, he sells her in order that the purchaser shall do what he likes with her. But if he chooses to reject her, she must be returned back home. So the Covenant Code shows us that the enslavement of a family member was permissible and indeed fully legalized within early Israelite society. Slavery is a complicated issue, and I would not want to say anything in its favor, and yet, when you go back to the ancient world, slavery was not the worst condition. And that's a very it's a tough sentence to utter, but it is true. It was worse, as we read from this passage, to be completely destitute, working from day to day. When Odysseus descends to the underworld, to Hades, to talk to uh, Achilles and other people, he says to Achilles, Achilles, be cheerful. You're a big shot down in Hades. People know your reputation and so forth. And Achilles replies here, I would rather work as a day laborer for a man who has no property than to be lord of all the hosts of the dead. And what he means by this is, this is the worst condition I can possibly imagine working as a day laborer with, with no guarantee that I'll be employed the next day for a man who is himself very poor. What he does not say is, I would rather be a slave. Because a slave, some slaves, some slaves had some security, particularly domestic slaves. Slavery, as the great ancient historian Moses Finley said, was a continuum of unfreedom. At the one end, there were certain privileges. At the other end, it was a terrible condition to be in if you happened, for instance, to be working in the mines or in the quarries where you would be worked to death. 
<clears throat> Everybody faced certain hazards in the ancient world. Giving birth was one of them. I'll come back to that in a moment. A fire. There were no safeguards, and every home had a hearth in the center, and the smoke and the flames would simply exit through a hole in the roof, if that were the case. Not always would there be anywhere for the uh, smoke to exit either. Uh, volcanic eruptions, accidents, floods, plagues, warfare, malnutrition, and famine. All but malnutrition and famine would affect everybody pretty well equally, irrespective of their status, irrespective of their position in society, irrespective of their wealth. We know that there were floods, and that these floods were often devastating. Our earliest evidence for this comes not from the story of Noah in the book of Genesis, but from a flood narrative associated with the epic of Gilgamesh. And we see here a tablet from that epic, which comes from Sumeria, which is dated about 2,500, uh, which speaks of a flood narrative associated with a figure called Utnapishtim, who survived the flood, and who, like Noah, was spared because he was a good man. And Ea, the god who brought on the flood, told him to build a boat. So this story goes back centuries and millennia within the Middle East in terms of flood narratives. And the evidence for it can be found archaeologically in the record of a particularly severe flood that occurred some 5,000 years BC in the area of Mesopotamia and the southern shore of the Black Sea. The island of Santorini, which is also in the Cyclades, was destroyed by a volcano in 1550. It's been described as Little Pompeii, because on the scale of Pompeii, it's, it's, it's tiny by comparison. And yet, one day, the island erupted. The sea covered over the volcanic Cadera, eventually, and either the people fled, or at least they left the site of Akrotiri, because archaeologists have found it, and there are no bodies to be associated with the discovery, unlike Pompeii. Those are the famous plaster casts that come from Pompeii. And um, Pompeii was destroyed in CE 79, a very average Roman town. The point being that accidents, events of this kind, cataclysmic destructions were not uncommon. And there was nothing people could do about it, of course. There were just no provisions in the case of a catastrophe on this kind of scale. And then there was plague. The great plague of Justinian, which took place probably around 541, raged for the better part of a decade, destroyed perhaps between a half and a third of the entire population. Estimates as to the numbers of dead vary from about 10 million to approaching 100 million. And plague was a seasonal occurrence. It was not on this scale, of course, but every year in urban areas especially, there would be an outbreak of a plague which would carry off a portion of the population. These are the facts of life. This is what people were dealing with on a daily basis and what they accepted as part of the cost of living and getting by and staying alive. So, when we want to look at the way that ordinary people lived, where do we go? This list shows us what our sources are. Art, literature, papyrology, inscriptions, archaeology, 
and by archaeobiology, I mean the study of ancient bones. They are not an ideal collection, at least because the focus of artists, the focus of writers, is about people who are privileged, not people who are commonplace. They have no interest in that. They are elite writers, and they are speaking to an elite audience. And besides, why would they talk about the everyday, the mundane, the commonplace? So we have to dig deep into our sources to find out how people lived in the ancient world. Rarely do we see attempts to depict people who were ordinary. And on the left there, there is a little ivory statue of a hunchback. To the right, a hunchback on a Roman mosaic. To the right of that, an old woman who is dragging a basket of fruit which he is probably going to sell in the marketplace. And at the far right, a drunken old woman. So all these images, is this all we have? Iconographically, it pretty well is. There was just no interest in showing what ordinary people looked like or how they lived their lives. What we see instead in excess, we might say, are images of ideal human beings. On the left there, the standing male figure of Greek art, the kouros, as he is called. He was placed over a grave, or alternatively, at a sanctuary of Apollo, and he is depicted with perfect body, perfect proportions. In the case of a grave marker, it stood over the grave of somebody who died, a young man fighting in battle. Apollo, to the right there, from the wonderful pediment at Olympia. He's holding his arm out, and he is adjudicating at a battle between Lapiths, a superior civilization, and centaurs, those creatures half horse, half human. It's the same when we come to depictions of women. That is the famous Nike of Samothrace in the Louvre, and she too is perfect. And when we move to the Roman period, that is the Emperor Augustus. He too is depicted like a heroic god. And of course, that persists as far as the Renaissance, Michelangelo's David, whereas we know this was only a child who was fighting against Goliath, according to the Bible. And Raphael's miraculous draft of fishes, again, perfect figures. The disciples here shown in all the strength and fullness and completeness of bodily health. It's only when we get to Rembrandt that pictorially we come to a place where we see ordinary people like here, just listening, beggars, whoever they might be, old people, people of no social consequence whatsoever. When we turn to literature, we have one author who was a slave. His name is Epictetus, and he became a Stoic philosopher. But unfortunately, he doesn't tell us what slavery was like. He doesn't talk about the institution. He doesn't describe his life as a slave. He talks philosophy. I've got nothing against philosophy, but I wish he had just left us some inkling of what it was like to get up in the morning and work for another man without any social identity whatsoever. I mentioned the dangers of childhood, childbirth in the ancient world, and sticking with literature, Medea in Euripides' play, Name the Medea, gives this haunting line. She says, I would rather fight in a hoplite battle, that is to say, heavily armed, three times 
than give birth once. Giving birth in the ancient world was extremely hazardous. The chances of a successful delivery were less than 50%, and also the possibility of dying in childbirth was extremely high. And that was a condition that has lasted for hundreds of years. Just to give one example, Queen Anne, pregnant 18 times, four live, five live births, and only one survived infancy. So any woman who went into labor in the ancient world knew that she was putting her life at grave risk. In some ways, the best literary source for the ancient world is to be found in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. When we read ancient texts, classical texts, Latin and Greek, they're filled with long speeches delivered by politicians and other leaders and so forth, like Pericles, who appears over there on the far right of that picture, delivering, let's say, the great funeral speech in which he speaks of Athens as an education to Greece and a place where poverty is no bar to political office. It's magnificent. Look for dialogue and it's not present. You have to go to the Hebrew Bible. And I take this single example as so rich in its detail. You'll remember that when Abraham and Sarah reach old age, they don't have a child. And Sarah says to Abraham, you should impregnate our slave girl, Hagar, which she does, and duly, Hagar gives birth to a boy called Ishmael. And then, miraculously, Sarah, even though she is old, gives birth to Isaac. And at that point, the dynamic in the household changes, and Sarah becomes resentful of the fact that Hagar is in the household with their son, Ishmael. And she persuades Abraham to eject Hagar from the household, which, being somewhat weak, he does. So Hagar leaves, she goes into the wilderness, and she has this infant with her, and she has no resources, and we read this sentence. She hid the child under a bush and sat opposite about the distance of a bow shot so that she wouldn't have to see Ishmael dying. It is a condition that so captures the imagination, but also it is one that is absolutely true to life. There would have been many distressing situations where the parent of a child was quite incapable of being able to feed that child and had no alternative but to distance herself from that child as that child was dying. And when I say that sentence, of course it is not a situation that is exclusive to the ancient world. It is a situation that has lasted to this day. The Gospels as well prevent, pre present a vivid picture of the everyday through dialogue. This, this short piece of dialogue from the Gospel of St. Matthew, um, <clears throat> which describes Peter when he is denying that he was associated with Jesus, a simple maid, we don't know her name, nothing, but she's a maid and she appears and she is significant within the account. You were with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. And then another maid, again anonymous, comes in and says, Yes, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. I swear I wasn't. And then a passerby, a passerby says, you're one of that lot. I can tell by your dialogue, dialect, you're a Galilean. Now that little dialogue as well, to me is the authentic voice 
of the other side of history. It's telling us something about that moment that really captures it and makes the incident come alive. We also have a multitude of papyri. Papyri, papyrus was the main writing material of the ancient world. And it has survived in quantity in the sands of Egypt, which because of their heat, preserved them. No papyri have been found in Greece. So it's only after the conquests of Alexander the Great that we have this abundant cache of or treasure trove of papyri that do shed some light on the ancient world. And here's one which in this simple sentence, again, tells us so much about how people were living. If you give birth and it's a boy, let it be. In other words, let it live. But if it's a girl, cast it out. It's written by a soldier who was billeted somewhere in Alexandria, and he's writing to his wife in Oxyrhynchus. And he's saying to her, we can't raise a daughter, but we will raise a son. It's odd that they didn't have this conversation before he went away. But that too shows the constraints that were people under in the ancient world. There was a great eagerness to have a child, but a male child primarily. If you had daughters, they were an economic liability, and you might find yourself impoverished or worse as a result. It was one of the hard facts of life, and although we may consider it to be inhumane, to think in this way, this family basically had no alternative. We move to archaeology, and archaeology is a very valuable source, as we might expect, because it provides us with evidence of ordinary objects that are found, and in this case, of an apartment block. In Rome, the poor lived in multi-story blocks, such as you might find in Erie, Pennsylvania, um, some five stories high. The bottom floors would have been occupied by wealthy people. The upper floors would have been occupied by the poor, and those would have been the ones which were a tremendous health hazard and dangerous to live in as well. The Roman satirist, Juvenal, writes, the last to burn, when such a building catches fire, is the one at the top whom a bare tile protects from the rain. So think of the condition of somebody who has no money whatsoever. All he can do is to afford the rent to live in probably what we would call a garret with walls that are caving in, the roof is leaking, and maybe he has a portable brazier because he couldn't have a fireplace or anything of that kind. So probably he had something rather like this. This is a um, oil lamp dated around the first century which shows a woman who is tending a fire. What a health hazard that would have been if it gets knocked over in the night for some reason, or if the coals spill out, or maybe she gets asphyxiated. These were all problems. And if there's a fire down below in the insula, as they were called, these big multi-story blocks, then there would be no chance of surviving either. If you were sick and you had money, you might be able to pay for a medic to come and tend to you, or you might visit one of the great healing sanctuaries, such as this one at Epidavros in mainland Greece. The curiosity from our point of view is that these great healing sanctuaries, this one dedicated, as I say, to Asclepius, were also places where medical science reached a degree of proficiency that had not been seen ever previously in the world. 
And um, people came there, and they would remain there for a length of time, possibly, possibly months, waiting for a miraculous cure. But at the same time, engaging the services of the medical profession that would be available to them. But this was something that only the wealthy could do. If you were sick in the ancient world, you would have to get better by yourself. <clears throat> when it comes to captives of war, life was rough. This is an inscription from the uh, gates, Balawat gates, of a big uh, public building that was erected by the Assyrian king Asher Nazipal II. And what he says here is chilling. I burned many captives in the fire, some I cut off their hands or their noses, or their ears, or their fingers, or I put out their eyes. In other words, I mutilated them. And um, this is not exclusive to Assyria. We read in the Hebrew Bible um, that at the beginning of the book of Judges, that the um, thumbs and toes of a Canaanite king are chopped off. Recently, in the last 10 years, an extraordinary discovery was made in mainland Greece of a group of bodies, skeletons, 79 of them in total, known as the captives of Phaleron. They were chained together by the wrist, and they date to the third quarter of the seventh century, and they give an indication as to the level of brutality that was being perpetrated there in a society that was on its way to becoming a democracy, the democracy that we admire so much. And this may well have something to do with the fact that these people were in opposition to the democratic movement. And these proto-democrats, as we might call them, punished their opponents in this barbaric way. What could you rely on in the ancient world? If you were down and out, if you were poor, if you were vulnerable, was there any recourse to some form of protection? All the monotheistic religions did attempt, at least, and did enshrine certain moral precepts that were intended to protect those most vulnerable. So, for instance, we read in Exodus, you shall not abuse any widow or orphan. We read in Proverbs, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, God. We read in Psalms, defend the weak and the fatherless. We read in St. Matthew, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. And we read in the Quran, those who give out of their own possession will have their reward with their Lord. So there was an attempt, at least, made by monotheistic religions to give protection to those who were weak and defenseless. With what success and with what impact generally upon society, it's impossible to know. Human empathy goes back a long way. It goes back, potentially, 50,000 years BP, before the present, to a cave in Iraq called Shanidar I, in, in Kurdistan, where a discovery was made of a human skeleton, which obviously had suffered injury, Notably, brain injury, as we see from the center of the skeleton there, but also that injury had affected the use of the arm and of the leg. And yet, these injuries had healed, which means that that person had, in some sense, been cared for by her or his 
relatives, and companions. So human compassion goes back even to the Neanderthal period. There are lots of unknowns about daily life in the ancient world. What was the crime rate? We think of these societies as being, yes, very warlike and so forth, but can we know whether murder was common, whether theft was common? Most of them policed themselves. There was no police force as such. And that meant that people would have had to report and people would have had to take care of their neighbors, their friends, their relatives, and such. But did that mean that it was a lower crime rate than what we face today? That's impossible to know. How were thieves punished? We never hear that. Probably by a degree of social exclusion. It would have been humiliating to be caught in that mode. But if we go back further, we read in the Code of Hammurabi, for instance, that it is not uncommon for certain crimes for people to be burned or to be mutilated in terms of losing their arms or something of that kind. How prevalent was anxiety in the ancient world? Is this a modern phenomenon? What about mental illness? We don't know anything about that either. It's tempting always to think of the ancients as somehow just so preoccupied with getting by that they didn't have any room for being mentally disturbed. But that may not be the case. It's one of those questions that I would love to be able to investigate further, but I just don't think there is any evidence to help us to understand and answer that question. How prevalent was alcoholism? We hear of alcohol being the gift of Dionysus. So it was something that the Greeks and the Romans prized very highly. And we do occasionally hear of alcoholics like Alexander the Great, but how common was it as a phenomenon? What did people do when they became distressed? Did they turn to drink or what? What happened to slaves who outlived their usefulness? If you had a domestic slave and that slave served you for years, what would you do with that slave? It's a question, again, without an answer. And what was the fate of the childless? If you didn't have a child to look after you, a son, that is why Isaac is so desired by his parents, a son. A son will look after you in old age. If you don't have that son, you have nothing. And then, where do you go? How does your life tail off in the edge of old age? But there are things to appreciate, and I want these to be emphasized as well, because as much that the ancient world got right, I think. Number one, you probably lived in a supportive community, a community that would have been tightly wound together, so that if you had a problem, it's quite likely that it could have been solved. That's not to say that they would take you on and look after you, because resources, as I keep on saying, were very slender for everybody on the other side of history. But nonetheless, that tight community could be very supportive. There was no pollution in the modern sense of the world. word. Yes, rivers got polluted, and it might be the case that um, um, there was an outbreak of plague and so forth, but not pollution as something that you dealt with on a daily basis. Everything was handmade, nothing was made on a conveyor belt. Your sense of smell, your hearing, at least in youth, I have to put that as a proviso there, would have been much stronger than they are today, and your memory more acute. We hear of people who knew the entirety of the Iliad, 16,000 words, and the Odyssey, about 12,000 words by heart. That was no great feat. That was something you could do. People had little computers in their mind, in their heads, that remembered things. One great thing, there was no internet. You didn't have to answer emails in the middle of the night. If, like me, you wake up and you think, ah, I'm not getting back to sleep, I'll check my email. 
A few words of advice when you go back in time. Carry a few stones around, that's always useful. You don't know what you're gonna meet. And particularly, most dogs are to be avoided. Don't go out unaccompanied. You really need to have somebody alongside you because yes, there are brigands around and the nighttime is dangerous. Don't leave a fire unintended for obvious reasons. Don't drink the water unless it comes from a fountain. You don't know whether a dead sheep might have been somewhere upstream. Carry any coins you have in your mouth. Nobody had bags, by the way. Um, coins, you don't want to carry them in the palm of your hand. That's far too dangerous. Keep them in your mouth. We know that's what the ancients did. Steer clear of other travelers on the ancient road. That's what happens when um, Oedipus meets Laius and they have a collision and Oedipus kills Laius, kills his father. If you have an animal, keep it indoors. It'll serve as a radiator, keep you warm at night. That was a feature of life in the Middle Ages as well. Carry a big stick. The universal facts of life. Greek statues, wonderful. I love looking at sculptures and vases and so forth. But what moves me most, I would say, are the simple things of life. A Roman sandal found in Londinium, London, which I saw this last month or so. Beautifully crafted, as you can see, because everybody needs shoes, right? A cooking pot, blackened, as you can see, because it's been worn. Or, back to the 1500 BCE, a beautiful toilet, right? Most people wouldn't have toilets, it goes without saying. Most people would be caught short, so to speak, if they were out, and they would find, presumably, a hidden corner. And that's a fact, as well, we should bear in mind. The smell of ancient cities would have been intense. Some things never change. 60,000 years ago, people were playing music. That's a wonderful thought. That is a bone flute from Slovenia, the earliest musical instrument in the world. But who's to say? that it is actually the earliest. It's the earliest we know of thus far. And there's a Roman die with a little six on it. And um, it's exactly identical to the one we have today. Probably found with a legionary, um, because after all, um, you all want to be diverted in some way at the end of a hard day. Some things, as I say, never change. Another thing that never changes is that we like kitty cats. Uh, kitty cats got domesticated before dogs, and probably because when uh, humans became sedentary, when they settled in um, regular communities and they had storages of grain, the cats would kill the mice or the rats or whatever it might be. But this is very moving because 7,500 years ago, perhaps, that's to say 9,000, um, sorry, BCE, 9,000 years ago, this cat was buried with its master or mistress. And um, so domestication of animals begins a long, long time ago. When I was doing this course, I was inspired by Brunowski. He, is a, um, um, he was a biologist and a mathematician, uh, Polish-British he was, and he ended his course, which was all about the ascent of man, about how invention and discovery has affected us and changed us, which is something that I always think about. And he ended by walking into the mud at Auschwitz, leaning down, into that mud and saying, we have to touch people. And that's what I feel when I, when I talk about the ancient world and the other side of history. And I just, I just want to end by, I, I actually wrote something out so that I wouldn't lose myself. So if you don't mind, I'll start with this. 
In times we're living through, the present times that we're living through, there is only one side of history, because wherever the human race is heading, we're all heading there together. So I'd like to end with a plea first for tolerance and acceptance, and second, an imaginative engagement and appreciation for the millions of people, the billions of people who lived before us and made our lives immeasurably more comfortable and more secure than theirs were. In my ideal world, theists and atheists alike would fast with Muslims at Ramadan, remember the Exodus event at the Jewish festival of Pesach, and celebrate the birth of the Savior at Christmas. Each of these festivals has something profound to tell us about the very human search for the meaning of life and for our place within it, irrespective of which religion or no religion we subscribe to. It's a search which originated tens of thousands of years ago. At the end of the Iliad, King Priam of Troy comes to the tent of Achilles to beg for the body of his son, Hector, whom Achilles has slaughtered and whose body he has mutilated. And what he does, Homer tells us, is he grasped the hands, the man-slaying hands of Achilles, who had slain so many of his sons. And then a remarkable thing happens. The two of them weep. And all difference between race, all the hatred disappears for that brief moment. Shanti, shanti, shanti are the words in the Upanishads. They're the words that end T.S. Eliot's great poem, The Wasteland. Those on the other side of history are always present. History is now. And finally, just as I was thinking what to say today, because I thought all this up this morning, of course, when I got up, I happened to read something that Salman Rushdie wrote when he was awarded the Peace Prize at the Frankfurt Book Fair last month. And I'd just like to read it to you. He said, we live in a time when freedom of expression is everywhere under attack from reactionary, authoritarian, populist, demagogic, half-educated, narcissistic, careless voices, when places of education and libraries are subject to hostility and censorship. I'm deeply honored to have been invited to this forum whose mission in the words of its president, is to examine the past, study the present, explore the future, to bring progress to your community. And I dare add, to the world outside your community. Thank you very much. How about one more round of applause for Dr. Robert Garland? What a note to end on. So thank you, thank you, thank you for, for covering so much in such a short amount of time. It's an unenviable task we gave you, but I think that it's such an uplifting moment at the end to clearly say we, we, we the part of the 117 billion have, have gotten to a good place, but we aspire to get to a better place. But you, the historian, if, if you had the chance to go back and uncover more of 
the other side of history, to invite them in from the margins, to include them more fully in our story. If you could go anywhere in time and spend one day recording something, one week recording a historical event, and an entire year, where do you go? Well, I'd like to begin by saying that um, I think that <clears throat> all historians get a lot of things wrong. You know, we make all kinds of assumptions about how people lived, what they were thinking, um, what their daily life was like, and that that is, if I could go back in time, the first thing I, I think I would probably choose Rome, actually. I, I think I'd choose a city. Um, Rome was, I mean, there are more beautiful cities. Ephesus, beautiful city. Alexandria, you know, these were planned cities, but Rome grew up. But I think it would have brought me to the heart of the ancient world. And I think I would have chosen to be there, I, I was saying this sort of briefly earlier, um, probably on the, the day that Julius Caesar tragically was killed. Um, because I think it would have brought to light not just the daily conditions, which fascinate me so much, but also the mentality of the people at a time of enormous change. You know, the Roman Empire, I, I've talked mostly in my lifetime about the Greeks, but the Romans equally occupy me. And how they were able to expand and produce a world where you could go to bed at night and be pretty certain you would wake up alive the next morning. You know, that we take for granted today, thank goodness, but it was not the case in the ancient world. And I would have loved to, I hate to say this, forgive me for saying this, sit in a Latin, uh, sit in a Roman latrine and just hear the conversations around me and watch and think, are, you, are we really doing this? You know, because the sense of privacy was so different in the ancient world as well. You know, we take for granted that we are a private people and we, we just don't do things collectively, but the Roman world, everybody was on top of everybody else. So that's one of the ways in which I think it would have been so different. And, and, and of course, folks, to learn more about the Roman world, the legends brought to life, this is a friendly reminder. This book is for sale tonight. I am told just a few copies remain in the lobby. I'm not encouraging you to stand up and leave just yet. We're continuing our conversation, but you'll have a chance to get your copy signed and talk to the actual author. Uh, Robert, you brought up Alexandria, so I want to ask you. So I, I think that part of my fascination with what it is that you study is, is knowing what we don't know, yes. and then knowing what we don't know that we actually know that we don't know, and we've lost the Library of Alexandria. Yes. And I'd like to hear you talk about what you think we could get if we could go back to that and uncover that in other moments where we've lost history, mm -hmm. if we could recapture that and better understand ourselves. Yes, of course, the, uh, the, the um, Library of Alexandria was a tremendous loss it's difficult to know quite what we would have that was first class because, you know, the entirety of ancient learning was vast. The output, the literary output was colossal. Some of it was probably fairly second rate, but wouldn't it be great to have some of those second rate authors as well to be able to compare with what we have? Because, you know, we look at the world of antiquity and say, my gosh, who wrote plays like Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides? Who wrote histories like Thucydides, Herodotus, Tacitus, Livy, etc.? This is absolutely outstanding. But number one, we don't know whether we haven't lost outstanding works that would absolutely alter our sense of the ancient world. It's unlikely, but it's not impossible. And also, Going again with the ancient, with the other side of history side to things, I, I would really like to see some hack work as well that just <laughs> didn't make it, got burned, etc. You know, I, I think that would show the ancient world more like ourselves, really, and not simply a world of elite authors.
perhaps some of the writing on bathroom walls of ancient history that we could uncover <coughs> and unpack and go and get that. Uh, folks, I have plenty of questions, but I know we're also taking yours, so I do want to make sure that we save enough time to get to those. Uh, if you do have a question on an index card, hold it up. One of our helpful team members will come and get that from you. I'd just like to add that I love Roman graffiti. So, so, <laughs> so questions from the audience, but why do you well, love Roman it's, graffiti? Well, because it's very graphic. It can be very scurrilous, but there's a lot of political graffiti as well. You know, vote for so-and-so, that kind of thing. It shows us the everyday again in a, in a particularly vivid light, I think. And, and I, I appreciate the everyday approach and the importance of it, the significance of the small details make up the fuller picture. Something that, that I was really struck by in, in your presentation was the notion of death being everywhere all around us, stalking us 24-7. You wrote your dissertation on death. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I've always been interested in death, and I find it a... Um, a wonderful counterbalance to my commitment to life. I, I don't, I, I'm not a, I don't think that studying death is morbid, not in the least. I have a particular fondness for cemeteries. The spookier the better. Um, and I've always found that the experience of being in the company of, not the company, but you know what I mean, of the dead, and studying the dead has been exhilarating. It's made me feel more alive. And I've always enjoyed also trying to grapple with people's idea about the next stage in life, if there is a next stage in life. And the ancients, of course, had their own views of it. And um, Greeks and Romans happened to believe primarily that there was not much to the next life, that it was all indifferently miserable. But even that thought gave them, I think, a particular attachment to life, because life is what we know. It's the only thing that we certainly possess. And I always can think, you know, co contrasting it with the Olympians, with the deities, with the gods that live forever, what a boring life that would be. I... Thank you for that, and thank you, audience, for such wonderful questions. We're going to try to get through as many of these as we can as, as I start to read them. I, I think the answer might not be an email, but this person's asking, what item from the present world would you want future historians to discover? Oh. What's significant to us now that you hope in the future they will discover and think something about us? Now, that's a question I, I have not got a ready answer to, I have to say. Um, not an email. <laughs> now, are we, talking, um, are we talking about something that would be, well, I, I suppose I'm thinking aloud here. There are two different answers to this question. <clears throat> One is, what do we feel sufficiently proud of that we would think, yes, that represents us at our best, the other one is, what is most characteristic of us? And those are two different answers, I think. If it goes to something that we feel, you know, particularly proud of, I have to say, I have a terrible weakness for Shakespeare, but of course that's going back 400 years, and the questioner might say, no, 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 I want something that's typical of today. But, but if you had to pick Shakespeare and it's only one thing, what do you pick and then we'll come to today? I can pick Shakespeare. I, I'm allowing you as the moderator. <laughs> I'm just curious what part of Shakespeare you pick, if it's only one thing, and then we'll get to today. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <laughs> Thou art more lovely and more beautiful. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and often is his fair complexion dimmed. And every fair, well, you don't want me to go on. <laughs> we, we didn't <laughs> practice that. <laughs> Okay, so that's your Shakespeare. What of today you hope future historians find? Well, would it be architecture? Um, I would think, you know, I'm in the town of Frank Lloyd Wright, or at least of his office. 
Um, I'd love a Frank Lloyd Wright building to survive. I think it's not necessarily typical of all architecture today or of the last century, but I would settle for falling water. <laughs> so how did the ancient world transition from people having such mobility, being on the move, to being bound to the land in a feudal society? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a great question to which I am going to have to make a guess. Um, I think that the, um, well, feudalism, of course, grew up in Europe, um, not so much in, um, well, I, I'm, I'm not sufficiently f informed about medieval Italy, for instance. I, I think feudalism was more a kind of northern European event. I may be wrong with this. Um, but it, it came about partly, of course, because of a development in terms of a system of organization that was very hierarchical, very, very highly stratified. So that, you know, you have the king, the king at the top, the barons, then you have the people underneath them, and finally the peasant farmers. It was a society that produced a degree of stability at the cost of the kinds of um, mobility, as you say, that existed previously. It came about not directly, of course, from the ancient world, but when a new kind of society was evolving in the Middle Ages. When the world emerges from the Dark Ages, say in the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, there is a move towards, I think, a more stratified society based on specifically land ownership. Land ownership was always important, but I think it was then found impossible to, to, to farm the land unless it had a population that could be relied upon year in, year out, to produce, to do the work, but also to give a significant portion of what they produced um, to their overlord. But the actual circumstances under which it grew in that way, I think, has much to do with arrangements in terms of the, 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 the very emergence, again, of a civilized world that depended on a centrified government that was broken down into boroughs, in the English system at least, where there would be the same stratification from the king down to barons and so forth at the manorial level, where there were certain divisions around the countryside where the population remained and was required to be without the possibility of any movement whatsoever. It's only when you get things like the Black Death that everything changes and that system breaks down, the feudal system is under threat, because no longer are people staying where they were, and suddenly their services are at a premium. So two questions up here about religion, and I'm gonna ask them at the same time because maybe they uh, uh, go hand in hand or can be explained together as we progress through history. One is, is thinking, and I, I, I don't know that this person thinking of it, but I thought of your slide where you said monotheistic religions and we're explaining that. They're asking about the significance of when we go from gods to God and we go from polytheistic uh, civilizations to monotheistic civilizations, so I'd like to hear you talk on that. Uh, but then also, it seems like religion was everywhere. Was religion a big part of the economy in the ancient world? So God to, gods to God and religion and economy in the ancient world. The beginnings of monotheism are unknown. I, I, I sort of speculate as to whether religion begins as a polytheism or as a monotheism. If you are living in the, let us say, the, the earliest evidence that we have for religion seems to be the Venus figures, figurines, little, little figurines, like the Venus of Willendorf found in Austria, which is a sort of, we describe them as a sort of fertility goddess, because big breasts, big hips, and a certain sense that you know, this could symbolize fertility. 
Now, were there other types of deities around at that point? Or was it subsequent that there was a emergence of a system of belief where, oh, we've got to have a God for the rain. We've got to have a God for the sea. We've got to have a God for the crops, etc., etc. So the very beginnings of monotheism are impossible to trace. Although, I think when we get later in history, down to say about 3,500 BCE, the pharaonic system is very significant. The pharaoh was a god. He was a god among gods, among hundreds of gods, of course, in the Egyptian system. But the fact of divine kingship, I believe, led the way towards monotheism. And in fact, the pharaoh Akhenaten, who was reigning in the 14th century BCE, tried to institute a monotheistic system of government, a monotheistic religion. He died after 15 years, and that was it. Now, Egypt, Israel, there's a connection, the Exodus event. Was it prompted, did the worship of the, the one God by the Jewish people, was that prompted by their experiences in Egypt? If there was a group of, and it's likely that there was, I think, even though there was not necessary an Exodus event quite on the scale that it's represented in the Bible, I think it's entirely possible that there was sufficient contact between those two cultures and that Egypt might have been the prompting, the incentive behind it. You had another question there about monotheism. It's, it's, so it was gods to God, wondering yes. how that, that transition impacts yes. us. And then the second one was about religion being present in economies. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I would go further. Religion was present everywhere. It was in the, it, it, just everything that you experienced including the economy, because the economy begins with feeding yourself. <clears throat> and that was something that, you know, in the Roman Greek system, there's Ceres, there's Persephone, there's um, Demeter, etc. Th this is one area where the gods are absolutely paramount. So there are gods that, like Hermes, for instance, who represent trade, so to speak, but there wasn't a human activity that was not in some ways directed by religion. And if we had been in a Roman or Greek setting here tonight, we would have purified this place. We would have sprinkled sacred water here, which I think you overlooked. And <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> you didn't do it. And we would have been a religious gathering because any group of people, whether it's a drinking party of just a few people, whether it is a family, which was also a religious unit, or whether it was the assembly of people voting in Athens, this was a religious gathering which was under the protection of the gods. So shifting from religion and economy for a second to government, is ancient Greece's attempts at democracy and other early uh, governments a sign of early humans recognizing the average person's plight? Yes, with a proviso which people always point out, we're talking about a slave society. And there was no movement ever, as I mentioned, to abolish slavery. And of course that's deplorable, but then we look at our own recent history, so let's not judge too harshly. But it is a fact that if you were an Athenian, yes, you felt liberated, you felt empowered, and every Athenian, in theory, was equal to every other Athenian. The irony behind this is that the Athenian assembly was effectively run by aristocrats. People like Pericles, Pericles over there, he was an Alcmeonid. He came from the very highest echelons of Athenian society. If you wanted to make a mark in the assembly, you needed to be a person of some consequence. Now that didn't prevent anybody from getting up. And in fact, there's a wonderful term in Greek, hobulomenos, he who wishes. Anybody who wishes can get up and speak in the assembly. But the fact of the matter is that at least in the fifth century, that the assembly was dominated by aristocrats. It becomes much more democratic after Athens loses the Peloponnesian War in the fourth century. But yes, the theory behind Athenian democracy is if you are an Athenian, then 
every Athenian is equal. So we have time for just one more question. And before I ask it, I want to do some housekeeping for the audience for upcoming events. And of course, we want to thank you, the audience, for being here tonight, engaging in this. And of course, uh, there is the, the, the multi-hour audible version, but a great version here of the history and plenty of other materials from Dr. Robert Garland, who will thank at the end. Uh, this book is available tonight, and uh, he is there to sign in. If I didn't get a chance to ask your question, you can ask him in person. Uh, and then housekeeping, I of course wanna thank all of our sponsors that make the Global Summit happen, and including uh, tonight's sponsor, Lecom Health, the naming sponsor for the Global Summit. A big thanks to them. Um, plenty more we could talk about medicine, but we are out of time. And upcoming events, folks, tomorrow night, uh, we have no event. But Friday, we are down at Gannon University in the Yale Ballroom to learn from Major General uh, Ed Bolton, who we will honor with the Thomas B. Hagen Dignitas Award. Uh, we take Saturday off. Sunday, we are back at Gannon for a media panel, State of Media in the State of the Race 2024. Uh, and then we will conclude the Global Summit this year on Monday, November 13th. That event has been moved from Gannon to Cathedral Preparatory Academy's uh, auditorium space uh, when we welcome in uh, Representative Val Demings and uh, former Lieutenant Governor and Chair of the RNC, Michael Steele, to talk about the state of American politics. So please, if you're not signed up, uh, there's still just a few seats available for those events. Don't wait on them. See one of our helpful team members. And of course, a big thanks to our team members, uh, as well as our board of trustees. Uh, some of the members I've seen in the audience, thank you for being here, encouraging us, inspiring us. Us and, and really calling us to the work that we do and our volunteers and again, all of you. So Dr. Garland, we talked about the what and why it matters, the other side of history and the full side of history, the one side of history. Uh, we went through so many other things, but, but I have several questions here from the audience wondering when, when did the other side of history grab your attention, pull you in so deeply and make this an area of focus for you scholastically and accessible to us, the ordinary, average people, to better understand our history. When did this grab you? Totally by accident, <clears throat> because, um, you know, I've, I've always been interested in um, what is broadly called social history. Um, and I, a very important moment for me was when I became interested in disability in the ancient world. Um, I remember when I went to birthing classes with my um, wife and um, we were told, you know, one in so many children will be born with a disability. And indeed, one person in our group was born with a child who had serious problems. And that affected me a great deal. And I began to think, well, how did this work in the ancient world? And I realized that nobody would really bothered to look at this and it the evidence is there you have to search for it but it's there and so that that was a very important moment that was 25 years ago or so let's say um, and then quite by accident I got given the opportunity to give this course because somebody else had been asked to do it backed off and somebody said would you do it and as I've I've often found when people have asked me to do things, oh, of course, that's what I've been waiting to do. And it deeply affected me. And of all the things that I said tonight, what I constantly come back to is my ancestors, your ancestors lived miserable lives in many cases. We would not have been able to go back to the ancient world for five minutes and thought that this was sustainable, and yet they persisted with their doggedness, with their commitment to life and to the next generation. And that to me is deeply moving, and it was the thing that kept on coming back and does to this day when I think about the other side of history. We owe so much to the past. Dr. Robert Garland, thank you for searching, researching, sharing, and telling those stories, especially with us here tonight at the Global Summit. Thank you, folks, for coming out. Book sale in thank the back. So we'll see you for the rest of the summit. Good night.